So the first words of my sermon today are going to be the last words that Jesus said on the face of this planet. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, therefore, Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, these were the last words of Jesus. And as we know, last words are important. Especially if the person knows that they're the last words, right? They know, that, and, and, and so I want you to think about this. Jesus, his last words, he knew they were his last words. And he chose that moment at which to utter these words to us. Therefore, go make disciples. I love the therefore. Therefore, it's all his entire ministry had led up to this point. Now that you've seen all this, therefore, go make disciples. And the reason I, I bring this up is because uh, as, as a church... Uh, the staff and I have been talking a lot about where do we go from here as a church? We've got people who are starting to take God very seriously. Where do we go from here? And here's where we go. We need to be making disciples. God has called you and I to do this together. And so the question that I want us to ask is, how do I start making disciples? Because here's what's happening. As, as I'm saying these words about making disciples, probably 90% of the people who are in here today are going, well, I guess this one's not for me, right? Because after all, um, how do I start making disciples when I don't know anything? Like I haven't read enough of the Bible in order to make disciples of somebody else. And so Todd must be talking about those people who have been Christians for a long time. Todd must be talking for the Christians who have, who have had time to really, really study God's word. But what if I were to tell you today that Jesus did not have any qualifier? He did not say, those of you who really know what you're doing, go make disciples. No, didn't say that. He was saying to all Christians everywhere, not just in that moment, but all Christians for the rest of time until the very end of the age, go make disciples. So for some of us, the question is, how, how do I start making disciples if I don't know enough? There's others of us in here that you came today because your life is a wreck, right? A lot of you guys in this service, you guys are... You know, you, you come regularly, but the truth of the matter is, and I'm, I'm anticipating that there's going to be some people that come today because we put out a text saying, hey, you guys are going through a rough time. We are going to pray over anybody who wants to be prayed over. And we've got some anointing oil. We're going to be doing that at the same time. And so there's some of us in here that are going, my life is a wreck, and so how am I supposed to start making disciples if my life is a wreck? As, as a pastor of this church, I, I know just about everybody in here pretty intimately. We, we've got a small enough church where I can do that. And I'll tell you this, I know marriage after marriage after marriage that is having a hard time in this church. And so you may be asking the question, how do I start making disciples if my family's a wreck? Maybe you're a kid here today. And if you're a kid here today, you're probably thinking to yourself, this, this message is not for me. This is for the adults, right? Making disciples is something that adults do. But what if I were to tell you guys, and I'm looking at the kids right now, what if I were to tell you guys that when Jesus was saying, go make disciples, he was talking to you. How am I supposed to make disciples if I'm a kid? To be honest with you, the only group of people that could possibly be here today that would be off the hook would be anybody who haven't, hasn't said yes to Jesus Christ yet. 
And if there was anybody in this room who's never said yes to Jesus Christ, you're off the hook for the main ser sermon, but guess what? At the end, we're coming for you, right? So just hang in there because we're going to answer this question as a church, but then we're going to make sure that you are a believer in Jesus Christ at the end. How do I start making disciples? Now, um, what I want to do is turn first uh, to John chapter 1 because there's this guy there's this guy by the name of Philip. And if there's anybody who came up with a very easy formula for, start, for the beginning step of making disciples, it's Philip. Let me give you a little bit of background. Philip had just met Jesus. From what we can kind of gather from the scriptures that we have, Philip literally met Jesus one day, and the very next day, he was trying to make disciples, right? Right? In fact, it, it might have even been the same day. So G he didn't even have 24 hours with Jesus yet. And he was already out trying to make a disciple. And so I love this story. I, I, this is one of my, my favorite stories um, of, of somebody trying to disciple somebody else. It's very, very simple, and I think it's going to give us a great formula. So uh, verse 45, Philip found Nathan, or Nathaniel, I'm sorry, and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. So he comes up and he says, remember the one that Moses wrote about thousands of years ago, the, the Messiah? Remember the, the same Messiah that all of the other prophets wrote about? We found him. And his name is Jesus and he's from this place called Nazareth. Now I want to ask you a question. If somebody came up to you and they said, hey, guess what? I just found Jesus. And you're like, Jesus? And he's like, no, like Jesus Christ. What would your instant reaction be? You probably seem like the, the, the comedian Fluffy. Ah, right? Like, like one of those, like, come on, right? But here's, here is, is Philip saying that to Nathaniel. So obviously, Nathaniel's like, come on, man. Really? The one we've been Waiting for, for thousands of years, you met him? Yeah. But then Nathaniel comes up with a question that Philip had not anticipated. Verse 46. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Nath you know, Nazareth was not a, not a great place. Nothing really good ever came out of Nazareth. And so really, the Messiah from Nazareth? And at this point, Philip's like, I didn't think he'd ask me that question. So you know what Philip did? He just did something very simple that you can do and I can do. He goes, oh, I don't, I don't know how to answer. I, that's a great question. But what he said was, come and see. Philip didn't try to answer the question. He, he just said, man, that's, I never thought it. You know what? Why don't we go back and ask Jesus ourselves? Hey, how can anything good come from Nazareth? And so he just invited him. He says, listen, bring all your questions. It's fine. But just come and see. And as we know, the rest of the story, Nathaniel walks up to Jesus, and Jesus knows his name before he even comes up, knows intimate details about Nathaniel's life, and Nathaniel's mind is blown. Nathaniel becomes a disciple Jesus Christ. And so here's Philip. He only knew Jesus for a day. And he was already making disciples for Jesus. Now, this is not the only time that this ever happened. This is just the most specific time that's ever recorded in Scripture. Uh, what I'd like to do is turn uh, to Matthew chapter 4. Because what we see happening with Philip and Nathaniel is actually happening a lot. In fact, it's happening all over Israel at this time. Because people are going, hey, have you heard about this Jesus guy? Man, I saw this Jesus guy and he said, he had some really cool things to say. He was, he healed somebody right in front of my eyes. Listen, you got to come and see him. And that was like, it wasn't just Philip that, do, that, that did this. Thousands of people were inviting their friends. Hey, you got to see this guy, Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 24. News about Jesus spread all over Syria. 
And the people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases and those suffering severe pain and the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and Jesus was healing them. And so words started getting around, hey man, you got to come and see this Jesus guy. And then finally in verse 20, 25, large crowds started to gather from Galilee, from the Decapolis, which is the Deca meaning 10, Opolis meaning cities, 10 cities, from Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan, all those people followed him. And so because this grassroots movement, remember they didn't have social media, they didn't like tweet out, hey Jesus is going to be here, like it was like a grassroots movement, people inviting other people and they started to gather and, and, and so many people gathered. What was Jesus going to do now that he had this huge crowd? Well, Matthew chapter 5 verse 1. This is now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. And his disciples came to him, verse 2, and he began to teach them, saying. And then after this, after it says saying, Jesus recorded here is the most prolific the most amazing sermon that has ever been preached on the face of this planet. It's called the Sermon on the Mount because he preached it on the side of a mountain. So it's pretty, pretty simple, right? But let me tell you, there's nothing simple about this sermon. Now, um, I'm not going to be able to go through this entire sermon with you right now, but we are going to do that in our small groups. You're going to have a chance in your small group to read through. Perhaps you've read little portions of it before, but you're going to have a portion to read through the entire sermon and just see what you can get out of this sermon. But what I would like to do is I want to give you the keys to being able to understand Jesus's entire sermon. And the key is found in the very first line that he says, verse three, blessed are the poor. And I believe that Jesus kind of paused there for a second before he said, in spirit. He just said, blessed are the poor. And he just kind of let it hang there for a second. Because back then, if you were poor, you were considered anything but blessed, right? The people who were rich were considered blessed. If you were poor, you were the opposite of blessed. You were cursed. But quite frankly, don't we, see, don't we think of it that way in our society today too, Right? Hashtag blessed? Does anybody, does anybody use that when they're broke? No, right? You, you, you go, hey, I got, a, I got a raise today. Hashtag blessed. Got a new car today. Pictures of the car. Hashtag blessed. Had a new baby. Hashtag blessed. Does anybody go, man, I'm out of money. Hashtag blessed. No, right? But Jesus is going, hey, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now here's the key. This is the key to the whole sermon. Understanding this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean to be poor in spirit? You see, when you approach the throne of God, if you approach it thinking that you've got everything figured out, you're going to miss it. The only way that you can approach the throne of God is if you're broken. If you come willing to say, you know what, I don't have it all figured out. And if you are broken, if, you're, if you are poor in spirit, then you will unlock the kingdom of heaven. Let's continue with this idea. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. The mourners are blessed. Why? Why? for they will be comforted. Now this is not talking about somebody who's mourning the death of somebody else. It's somebody who is mourning their poor spirit, their broken spirit. They're before God and they're mourning over their sin, over their sinful condition. But this is what Jesus says. If you approach the throne of God like this, guess what's going to happen? You will be comforted. God won't leave you like that. None of us want to get to that place, but if we are willing to get to that place, God is going to comfort us. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, 
For they will inherit the earth. The meek. I thought it was the bombastic people that inherited the earth. I thought it was the strong people. The rich people. No. The humble people. The people who approach the throne of God with humility will inherit the earth. Verse 6. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Are you guys getting this? Right? Right? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the mourners, blessed are are the meek, blessed are the people who are hungry and thirsty, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The people who who approach the throne of God hungry and thirsty for God, for a right relationship with God, those will be the ones that God fills. And so this entire sermon, Jesus is preaching to a bunch of people, Jewish people, who came to see Jesus thinking that they were okay with God. They came thinking, I'm good. I just came for the show. Jesus, in this sermon, wanted to help them to become the broken people that they need to approach the throne of God. And so for the rest of the sermon, after he gets through the blessed are, he starts to kind of tear them down a little bit. Because they thought that because they had the law, and because they were obeying the law, that they were okay with God. Hey, I've never killed anybody. I've never heard it. I'm I'm a good person, and so therefore I'm okay with God. And the rest of the sermon, Jesus is going, no, you're not. You're not good, and you're not okay with God. And then he begins to explain. And so a few verses later, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. He says, I'm not here to get rid of the law. I'm not anti the law. He says, I'm, I've actually come here to fulfill the law. And that's, that's a little hint to where he's trying to go. And then verse 19, it says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He says, I'm not here to get rid of the law. No. I'm here to show you what the law is really all about. And then he says this. I want you to think about this. Verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, unless your right relationship with God surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were the holiest people that lived on the face of the planet at that time. I want you to think for a second about the holiest person that you know. You know, maybe it's like a priest who's taken a vow of celibacy or a monk who's taken a a vow of silence. And we look at those people and we're like, oh, man, they really, those are some holy people. But I want you to imagine Jesus is next to you and saying, you see that, that monk, that you see that, that holy person? Unless your right relationship with God surpasses, unless you are more righteous than those people, you're not going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. What would your response be? Man, if those people aren't good enough, what hope do I have? And that's what Jesus was trying to get to. If those people who are doing all of those things don't get it, if, they, if they're not righteous enough, then you're not righteous enough. And so he begins to illustrate to them, because a lot of them are like, oh, come on, the Pharisees are good, right? Jesus says in verse 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Y- you know the thing that all the Pharisees are saying, do not murder? And you think that you're okay because you've never actually killed somebody? And Jesus says in verse 22, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which was an Aramaic term of contempt, right? It was like a strong word. They were not allowed to say that to each other. And if you said it to each other, then the Pharisees were coming after you. Anyone who says to his brother, Raka, 
uh, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the council of Pharisees. You could get in trouble for doing that. Then Jesus says, but anyone who says you fool, simply says you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus says, it's, it's not enough that you've never committed the physical act of murder, but many of us here are struggling with murder in our hearts. And if you've ever done that, that disqualifies you from being able to get into the kingdom of heaven through the law. Verse 27, he says, you have heard it was said, do not commit adultery. And a lot of us, you know, he's talking to the, to the Jewish audience, a lot of you guys here have never committed adultery. Good for you. Verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm going to be honest with you, this is really bad news for every guy that's in this room, right? Really bad news. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. I don't know about you guys. Somebody got a knife. I need, I need to poke this one out, Right? Thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> I actually meant to bring a knife and do this little thing with my eye, but freak you guys out, but I didn't do it. He goes on, verse 38. He says, you have heard it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. The law of Hammurabi, you guys remember this, right? You do something bad to somebody else, they get to do something equally as bad. Not worse, but equally as bad back to you. Verse 39, but, but Jesus says, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him your other cheek also. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, but he wronged me. And he says, Jesus says, look, him slapping you is wrong and you slapping him back is wrong. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If we want to get into the kingdom of God through the law, this is what it takes. Now, I love Jesus' sermon because here, here's, here's a funny thing. At, at the end of the sermon, I always kind of want to come to the point. At the end of the sermon, Jesus doesn't come to the point. It's brilliant. Because what he does is he uses this sermon to ask the question, how then do we even have a chance of getting into the kingdom of God? If this is the standard by which we're supposed to get into the kingdom of God, how, how are we supposed to fulfill it? And Jesus doesn't answer that in the sermon. In fact, the way that he answers it is with his life after the sermon, culminating in the moment that he gives his life on the cross for our sins. You can't do it. But Jesus says, I can. This was one of the most amazing sermons. Now, now wh why am I kind of going through this sermon? Because after all, our question is, is how do I start making disciples? And here's, here's what the answer, answer is. Just invite somebody to go to church. That's all Philip did, right? He just, he invited Nathaniel to go hang out with Jesus. All those people, the thousands of people who were saying, hey, come and see. What were they saying? Come and see Jesus. And what did they come to see? A sermon that Jesus preached on the side of a mountain. And at that, at that moment, Jesus began to plant the seeds of salvation into the hearts of thousands of Jews. And that's what Jesus has called you and I to do at, at the very beginning. Now, we're going to talk about how to get a little bit deeper into to discipleship. But listen, this is something that any of us can do. But may, maybe some of you guys are going, well, okay, invite somebody to go to church. What if I don't know enough? 
What if they start asking me questions that I don't have the answers to? Remember Philip? One day with Jesus. Nathaniel asked him a, a not very difficult question. Philip just went, I don't know. Just come and see. Maybe God is placing it on your heart to invite your boss or your coworker or your, your friend, your family member to come to church. And the thing that's holding us back is, yeah, but, but they might ask me a question that I don't have the answer to. You know, if they do that, just say, I don't know. That's a great question. I never thought about that before. Why don't you come to church with me? Come, we'll, we'll ask the pastor together. Not that I know. I'm just give them some false hope and maybe they'll accept Jesus or something, right? Invite somebody to go to church. That's the beginning of discipleship. You know, maybe you're here today and the, the issue is, is that your, your life is a wreck. And there's some of us who are here going, you know what? I, I am a horrible example. Like, I don't even want people to know that I'm a Christian. Because people are going to look at me and they're going to point and they're going to say, you see, Jesus doesn't work. But here's what I would tell you. Listen, even if your life is a wreck, Jesus told you to make disciples. And you know what I would tell you? Just use your wreck as wreck of a life as, as leverage to invite people to go to church. You know, you sit there, you just talk to somebody about how horrible your life is, and you're like, you know what, I really need to go to church. Can you come with me? Because I'm not strong enough to go on my own. Invite somebody to go to church. You know what, for the kids who are here today, here's what I would tell you. You guys have friends. You play video games with them, you go to school with them. And here's what I would invite you guys to do. Don't look around. I'm talking to you, girl. Invite somebody to come to church with you. And finally, the, the only group of people that could possibly be here today who would be off the hook for this would be the person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And at the end of this sermon, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you came in here today and you thought, you know what? I'm good with God we started reading the sermon from Jesus he said you know what you're not good with God but if you would raise your hand at the end of this service when everybody's head is bowed and every eye is closed and you would say you know what I'm ready to say yes to Jesus then you will walk out of this room today in a right relationship with God and so here's, here's what my challenge is. For, for those of us who have already said yes to Jesus, go to a small group this week. We're going to read the entire Sermon on the Mount together. At the end of the day, invite somebody to go to church. That is the beginning of making disciples. Let's pray. Let me have everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking around, nobody peeking, because this is a private moment for anybody who may need to say yes to Jesus as their Savior. But let me explain to you what saying yes to Jesus means. Saying yes to Jesus means understanding that God is perfect and God is holy. But you and I, we're not perfect and we're not holy. And here's, here's the part where, where we break your spirit, where, where you become poor in spirit, when you realize that we are separated from God because God is perfect and holy. And our imperfection and our unholiness is, is called sin. And that sin separates us from God. And we have no hope of being good enough to get to God. There's no amount of money that you can give. There's no amount of nice things that you can do to repair the broken relationship with God. But if you've missed out on everything else I've said here today, do not miss out on these next few words. But God loves you anyway. No matter how bad you've been in this life, God still loves you. You say, Todd, how, how do you know? Because he gave his only precious child to die for you and for me. 
Maybe you have people in this life who love you, but I can guarantee you this. There is nobody in this life that loves you enough to allow their precious child to die for you. That is the unbelievable love of God. The story goes that Jesus came from heaven to earth, that he lived the perfect life that you and I are not capable of living. But at the end of his time here on earth, instead of just going back up into heaven, which is what Jesus deserved to do, he laid down his life on a cross. He allowed himself to be executed like murderers were executed, even though he was innocent. Why? So that no matter what you and I have done in this life, when we believe in Jesus, our sins are placed on him and his righteousness, his right relationship with God is put on us. The best part of this story is that when the only precious child of God places his identity on you, he gives you the right to become a precious child of God yourself. So maybe you're here today, and today is the day that you say yes to Jesus. The way that we say yes to Jesus in this church is we just simply pray. And the only reason in a a few moments that I'm going to ask you to raise your hand is just so that I can know who I'm praying with. So if you're here today and you would like to say yes to Jesus, to become a precious child of God, I'm going to ask you to be brave and to raise your hand right now. Amen, sister. Anybody else? I'm going to pray just with you. So I want you to close your eyes and we're going to pray together. Say quietly to yourself, just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe in you. I believe, Jesus, that you came from heaven to earth. I believe, Jesus, that you lived the perfect life. I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose three days later just to prove that you're God. So Jesus, come into my life change me from the inside out. Lord, for the rest of us, for those of us who have said yes to Jesus, Lord, I pray that we would be excited over the fact that we just, we, we now have a young sister in Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would start a fire and a passion in our hearts to start inviting the people, even the people who we thought were impossible. I think of half of the people in here that I know that they were impossible when they came to know you. But yet, Lord, you are the God who makes the impossible possible. Lord, help us to see that we're your shining lights in this world, that we need to invite somebody to go to church. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.